Hello and welcome to episode 91 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is May 5th and together with Robert and Goran, we're here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. So today uh, we have a very special guest back with us. Evren will be providing us with um, insights and best practices on how Microsoft partners and Microsoft customers can deploy SAP on Azure in an optimized way while making sure security focused deployment is achieved. But before we hand over to him, let's quickly look at the news from this week. And I actually want to start um, with the DSAC technology days. So mm -hmm. it was <clears throat> amazing the last two days. I was actually on an on-site event. I really met people and, and talked to real life people. <laughs> so, so not only sitting in front of teams and, and having virtual ses sessions, but I was really able to, to meet and talk to a lot of um, colleagues there. And it was uh, really great, actually. It was a great event. Um, it, it had a great keynote. So the keynote in German is um, is also available on YouTube. There was also um, a so-called hyperscaler roundtable where um, AWS, GCP, Azure, and SAP were, were, were asked a few questions about um, data sovereignty, um, data protections, and, and, and so on, security in general. So a perfect fit, actually, for, for our session. Um, today and I think Microsoft didn't do. I mean, we we did. I think a fairly good job there um, to present the, the the benefits of um, why it actually makes sense, why it's good to run your SAP system on on Azure. There were also lots of other um, sessions, um, and I hope that the that the presentations will be available soon. Um, for me, obviously, one of the highlights was that from the SAP on Azure track. We had quite a few sessions, so um, let me actually, I think here, we, we had one around um, event-driven architectures, so where we had um, uh, one of our uh, customers, the um, Bergische Achsenwerke, talk about um, how they are using event-driven architectures. We had um, um, a session about um, Microsoft Sentinel, um, how uh, this this can be used in in an Azure environment, how it can be used to protect your SAP system. We had a very cool session about ThyssenKrupp, ThyssenKrupp Steel, and um, we we actually had talked about their success story um, some time ago. But it was mm -hmm. really amazing to hear Ahmed from from ThyssenKrupp Krupp, um, talking about their journey. Um, I I have also linked um, to the to the success story um, again. But what is really, really amazing is they, within 10 months, they migrated um, almost 100 SAP systems um, over to Azure. And it's it's not only that this was a just lift and shift, but they really also, they had Oracle systems, they had DB2 systems, they had HANA systems, they had, they had a full flavor of um, of systems. I mean, they are, they are a big company, there were obviously a lot of acquisitions, so it was a very, heterogeneous um, landscape and they within 10 months they not only consolidated everything to HANA and MaxDB but they also moved everything um, into into Azure and it was really amazing to, to listen to Ahmed what he was saying then um, yeah of course it went very easy everything went fine and um, now everything is on HANA now everything is on MaxDB and actually it's cheaper than on premise it was it was really a very inspiring um, talk by 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 Tusen Krupp there, so I think that was that was really really great. I also had one session about um, Power Platform and um, and SAP, so so where I showed um, how you can actually integrate uh, your SAP system in the Power Platform and then in Excel, in in, in Teams, in uh, yeah, in in Office, on on your mobile device. I actually put the recording, the demo um, on our YouTube channel. So um, if you just go to the main screen, you should be able to see um, the, the recording of the demo if you are interested in this one. Yeah, there, there were lots of other cool sessions um, about the um, ABAP um, extensibility concepts that are there, how we can leverage this um, um, sessions about um, open IB, um, ID connect um, in your in your ABAP stack. So it was. I mean, it was not only great to see a lot of um, friends and colleagues from SAP and customers and partners, but it was also really um, good to to hear from SAP some some updates. So if you are 
um, a member of DSAC and you couldn't attend, then you missed something, but um, then make sure that you at least take a look at some of the presentations um, that were shared there. Good. So that was the, the main point that I wanted to cover. Um, I said there's the, the success story from, from Tusen Krupp as well. But then um, on, a, on a somewhat uh, related note, especially when, when, when we um, now hand over to, to Evelyn in a second, there's a new blog post by Chitendra um, about the SAP router configuration with an Azure firewall. So obviously you have the SAP router for the connection to, to um, the, the SAP system or the um, to, to SAP. And um, in order to do this from, from Azure, you, you probably have a firewall in between. And Chitendra outlines um, what you need to do to do exactly this one. So you have your SAP systems, you have your, your SAP router, and then you have an Azure firewall. So what do you need to do to um, um, configure the Azure firewall so that it can um, connect to, to, to SAP? And he, he outlines the steps, um, yeah, what configurations are required. He then also talks about having not one, but two SAP routers. So one internal facing, one external facing SAP router. And again, highlighting the, the required configuration on the um, Azure firewall. So with this, um, quick, uh, I would say, teaser in, in the um, security space. Um, let's uh, switch over to Evren. Evren, I'm show several times, so I guess most of our listeners or, or watchers already know you, but but maybe still, maybe start with a quick introduction. Sure, and then sure, sure. I'm absolutely. Really interested so, ab in. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Holger, uh, Robert and Goran for having me again. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think this is my third or fourth time that I am actually just presenting um, here in this uh, amazing SAP on Azure YouTube channel, which you guys have been actually just uh, meticulously managing and maintaining. And content is vast and then very valuable. And I am so proud to be actually contributing to this um, efforts. So my name is Evan Bayruk. I'm an SAP on Azure Cloud Solution Architect from Microsoft Partner Success Team organization. So I'm actually um, not only SAP centric, I am looking at more on the networking and security which yeah. surrounds SAP on Azure. So this actually just you know um, comes down to artificial intelligence, DevOps, Azure administration, and of course, Microsoft Azure security. So, um, uh, in summary, I have more than 15 years of SAP experience in both IAS and PaaS. I also I also was uh, part of the networking and security um, engineering for um, uh, Microsoft and uh, and also like on premises initiatives before. So currently, I work with the I work within the um, partner success team organization, and I help Microsoft uh, global system integrators and advanced specialty partners in effort to help them successfully move their end customers SAP systems to Azure in a secure and optimized way. So what are these secure and optimized ways I'm going to be talking about? And before I actually just like you know go into that. I would like to give a little bit like insight into what we had also in the SAP space from the um, update perspective before I speak about the recommendations to enable secure and optimize SAP deployments on Azure. So uh, this is going to be actually just um, is going to have a correspondence to the next slides when I'm actually just speaking mm -hmm. about some of the functionalities and some of the, the latest updates that we had. So I'll start with the General availability of the Azure Backup is now supporting Vault Archive tier for Azure VMs, which is something not only important for the backup and recovery, but also is for the cost optimization for the backup is um, number one priority for like 80-85% of uh, uh, global system integrators and their partners because now they can retain their backup for a longer duration in a cost effective manner. They can use Azure Backup Vault's archive tier for their Azure virtual machines. So basically, this can be for SQL Server in Azure virtual machines, or it can be for SAP HANA in virtual machines. So what it does, they can move their long-term retention, which is LTR points, to the low-cost Vault archive tier, and they can perform restores from Vault 
archived here using a simplified integrated approach. So we also have some uh, previews that are actually just happening in this. So we can also just provide more insight if they reach out to us, if our customers and partners, we absolutely just can provide them with more information. So the bottom line of this um, uh, functionality and this update is that when you are moving the application backup data from Vault Standard to Vault Archive, what it does, the Azure Backup is doing the magic and converting the incremental data into a full backup. So this may result in increasing overall GB usage, but in the same time, the cost is going to reduce because of the huge difference per GB between the two tiers. So basically, when a customer is leveraging it, they're going to be able to see the cost benefits. They're going to be able to see the um, also like the administration of this and then the sim simplicity in the administration. So basically what I will suggest is our audience to take a look at this general availability Azure backup so they can write it down on their search engine and then they're going to automatically just going to go to this page in the same time. Um, we can provide some additional insight if they reach out to us separately. <clears throat> so other other good um, update about um, Azure uh, for SAP today is that the Azure Bastion support for Kerberos authentication, which is something that I'm very excited about, is because Azure Bastion support for Kerberos authentication is now available with both basic and standard SKUs, so there's an option there. So it's in public preview today. So basically, the key of this is why it is important is because Kerberos uses symmetric key cryptography and key distribution center, which is we, we call a KDC, to authenticate three aspects which are important, which is the ticket granting server, which we call it also TGS, just for the audience, maybe they don't know that. It is a ticket granting server, which is to connect the user with the service server, um, service server, which is SS, I mean, I'm memorizing these because I'm using this all, every day, but our audience does not necessarily have to just like memorize all these things um, because there are lots of like, you know, abbreviations. There's also Kerberos database um, in the component, which is storing the password and identification of all the verified users. And then there's a process on the authentication server performing the initial authentication in the Kerberos. Basically, the initial client authentication request, which is the, the protocol flow, start with the client logging into the domain, and then uh, following this step, the user asks for the TGT or authentication token from the um, from the AS, and then then the TGT then request is sent to the Kerberos. Um, then the verification of the client credentials and message de de decryption and request for accessing using the TGT, which is again. Ticket granting ticket is the actual the acronym that I just want to, you know, again, just mention that happens. And then it, it is followed by the creation of the ticket for the file server authentication, which use the file ticket decryption and then authentication of the target server. So basically there are lots of components, there are lots of details on that, but this is a good preview today available. So basically Azure Bastion support for Kerberos authentication is now available. So I would like the audience to go and just, you know, um, dig deeper into it and understand better because it has a lot of values for our partners and customers to leverage Bastion support for Kerberos authentication today. Mm -hmm. So um, another update is going to be SAP deployment automation framework from Azure DevOps service. So now um, what our partners and customers can do is they can use Azure repos repositories to store the configuration files and Azure pipelines to deploy and configure the infrastructure and the SAP application. Basically, this repo is going to be um, is going to be important that they can store the all the configuration files which are important so then they can use this Azure repos, repos uh, to store both the code from the SAP automation GitHub repository and then environmental you know configuration files so so the, the key point here is that for partners and um, and customers to use Azure DevOps service that I, I I just need to just mention and you know this is a very important highlight is that they will need an Azure DevOps organization, which means that um, 
they will need the DevOps organization to connect to connect them to the groups of the related projects, and then they can use their work account to automatically connect their organization to the Azure Active Directory. So this is a this is a nuance, but again, I'm just giving you some teasers. But there are lots of you know um, uh, nuances to to take a look at, and also like some details to actually just you know configure before using it or deploying it, and then. It is actually the details are important for successful implementation of the DevOps services. This is the reason why I just want to mention, but it is really worth spending a few minutes more on seeing that like you know, prerequisites and how you're going to be actually just needing the you know um, um, uh, uh, requirements to be configured to actually just successfully deploy it because the DevOps organization is the organization which is really just needed to connect the groups of related projects and also like you know um, uh, the pipelines to the work account and then they go from there by introducing it to the azure active directory and actually so, we already had michael mergel um giving us a preview on the on the azure devops um at i don't know a few is, weeks ago already so it's it's good to see how this has evolved basically exactly is exactly it's in also the details that i mentioned are so like unique important so once you actually fulfill all those pre prerequisites and then the deployment is actually very easy so that's why i am given this teaser like hey go ahead and just spend a few minutes more because there's some like little, little details that you have to fulfill mm -hmm. before you actually just execute it and then that works flawlessly so the last update, I'm going to be very quick. The Azure Monitor for CP application in um, Azure Native Monitoring, this is something very important. Why? Because our customers now can monitor different components of SAP landscape, mm -hmm. such as Azure Virtual Machines, High Availability Cluster, SAP HANA Database, SAP NetWeaver, and so on. Basically, you know, overall difference is that, like, why this is important and why this is something you know, um, better than the previous versions is because you now there is no like, you know, um, uh, no component in, um, I will say, um, they can not only just like, you know, monitor it, but they can also just like, you know, leave the, the patching maintenance overhead aside to Microsoft is going to take care of it. My, you know, customers and partners are no longer required to patch and maintain the collector VM since it is replaced with the Azure Functions. This is very important. So Azure Functions was not part of it, is now part of it. So now partners and customers do not need to do anything. All they need to do is enable, and then they go from there. They can enable in a spoke in the same region. They don't even need to do that like in the hub. They can do it in one spoke and they can do the VNet peering. And then one implement implement implementation of um, the Azure monitor in one spoke is going to correspond to other spokes. So um, it is all about the magic of that. And then the other thing is that no outbound internet access scenario is addressed. Basically, customers who do not allow outbound internet access from the SAP network can use a standard Azure Functions feature called route all to redirect the Azure traffic you know, to Azure Function with one click and you deploy AMS 2.0 successfully. So then there are also some platform improvements as that like it is backed up by the end of, uh, I'm sorry, end-to-end -end, uh, automated uh, test suite and unit test to ensure that engineering team can catch all those issues before our customer actually just like, you know, brings them to our attention. So there are lots of proactive, you know, work that is being taken care of for the Azure, um, Azure <coughs> monitor in this new release. And then the other one, the other uh, key benefit is that like customers can now choose the name of the managed resource group, which is deployed as part of AMS 2.0. And then this is this was not available before, is now available. So again, the last of details, please, um, our audience, our viewers, please just you know um, see more details on that. Mm. So now let's go to the main topic protection of a CP application with Azure Network Security Services. So what I'm going to do, I am not going to go in just like, you know, if I'm click, double click in each one of these. I am just going to show some of the best practices we are recommending or we are actually just bringing up to the surface and our partners and customers 
can either choose it or they can go with the 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 model that they want to actually just deploy their SAP because there are lots of ways to achieve the same result, but optimization is important. More importantly, how we are going to enable the maximum security while we are optimizing the networking and security is very important because everything is depending on the concept of the DMZ, um, which is the demilitarized zone for the cloud deployments. It's not the SAP DMZ, it is the approach of DMZ, which is a layered network security approach, which we are using to minimize the attack footprint of the SAP application. So basically the DMZ architecture, it is either comprised with, you know, um, uh, two layers or three layers of security and protection concept with additional user defined routes and firewall rules. Basically, it is all up to the customer's requirement to enable two tier or three tier, but as your network traffic to and from resources in a virtual network using network security groups and network virtual appliances are still remaining intact, we are still using those, but we are using some variations to actually just <clears throat> achieve this two tier and three tier architecture. So basically, DDoS protection, web application firewall, firewall, Azure firewall, network security groups, VNet integration. I am going to show real deployment scenarios with numbers and IP addresses, with routes, and how we are actually just doing the HA on HA and DR, how we are traffic, how we are routing the traffic to the, the right spoke and then how we are communicating between spokes. This is going to be shown in this presentation. So if, if anybody has any like additional questions, I am absolutely just going to ready to, to answer any question. We are already re just receiving some um, offline questions after these presentations are released and published. So I am willing to actually just help anyone who are actually just like, you know, writing a comment or sending an email directly to me. I am just going to be um, helping. So I'm going to emphasize on the DDoS. So why it is important and why I am actually just bringing in this up because DDoS attacks are classified in a three category today, like volumetrics, protocol and application layer attacks, which is pertaining to SAP or non SAP or any application. Volumetric and protocol attacks are also referred as OSI layer three and four attacks. Although the volumetric attacks get a lot of attention, we are seeing multi vector attacks concerns, and this is growing. Basically, um, what we are doing with the DDoS protection is that it defends against, you know, volumetric and protocol attacks on also like, you know, resource and application layer attacks, exploit vulnerabilities in an application is also protected by the DDoS. So basically what we are doing here is that we are absolutely just like, you know, recommending DDoS to protect everything inside the Azure VNet. So regardless what you have, like Azure Firewall, route server, you have, let's say that Azure Application Gateway, you have other components in the hub or in the spoke. So by the time we enabled Azure DDoS, Azure DDoS is going to be first protecting whatever that you are trying to protect your backend servers with Azure Firewall and Application Gateway. So I'm just going to give some more highlights on that and scenario as well, and how we can actually just save some money for deploying Azure DDoS or enabling Azure DDoS and also discounting the overall WAF cost 100%. Mm -hmm. This is a trick. I'm just going to give you this scenario. Everybody's going to love it. So most of the time, customers who like to secure their SAP workloads overlook very standard solutions, which are like available by Microsoft and Azure DDoS standard is one of them. Just looking at a few examples like the GRE, for example. So what is GRE? I actually just explained it in the previous sessions. Um, this is the generic routing encapsulation. It is used when IP packets, which we are actually just like, you know, worried about, need to be sent from one network to another or without being parsed or treated like IP packets by any like intervening routers. So they're not secure. We know that. So they do not provide encryption. Now for a private cloud, just plain GRE can be used. It is secured. So on the other hand, ping flood, which is also like the ICMP tool, is very common for DDoS attack in which an attacker takes down the backend server by overwhelming it with ICMP um, echo requests. And we also call them like pings. Pings or you know echo requests are the same things. So basically, um, 
why I'm talking about ICMP is because it is the intern, internal control message protocol. This is a network protocol which is used by network devices that we all have on Azure to diagnose the network communication, you know, from, and also like we are actually just like you know, using it to determine whether or not data is reaching its intended destination or not in a timely manner. So commonly, the ICMP protocol in a, in a network device such as routers is important because when we talk about that, we have to separate it from the internet protocol because unlike the IPs, ICMP is not associated with a transport layer protocol such as TCP or UDP. This makes ICMP a connectionless protocol, which means that one device does not need to open a connection with another device before sending an ICMP you know, message. So normally, normal IP traffic is sent using TCP as we know, which means that any two devices that exchange data will first carry out the TCP handshake to ensure that both devices are ready to receive the data. It is how it works. So basically, the ICMP protocol does not allow for targeting a specific port on a device. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about the resource attacks, like I mentioned about like you know, slow lures, for example, which is a type of denial service attack tool, which allows a single machine to take down the another machine's web server with minimal bandwidth and side effects. For example, like Holger, you mentioned about the um, uh, SAP router in, internal and external. The reason why we have it internal and external to actually just protect the internal one <laughs> is the external is public facing. So everything that we are actually just talking about internal and external facing, whatever that we are putting in the hub VNet or even the spoke, we have to just protect the resources inside those re inside those you know VNets, virtual network addresses, which is the overall like an isolation place. So by the time that we enable the DDoS, what we are doing is that we are protecting everything inside that VNet. So when it comes to like you know managing Azure VMs, administrators usually use like you know remote desktop for Windows or Secure Shell for Linux to remotely connect to and manage them. So basically, the initial method of get to get access to those VMs, the back you know the backend servers, like even the SAP router, like you know tools like you know remote desktop protocol RDP brute force attacks. So a brute force attack consists of checking all possible usernames or passwords until the correct one is found. Basically, this isn't the most sophisticated form of attack, but it is you know, very re relatively simple to perform and given enough time, so sometimes it works. So basically, to be able to blunt or prevent the RDP brute force attacks, we can take multiple measures such as like disabling the IP addresses by off maybe point to site virtual network private VPN, site to site VPN, Azure Express route for dedicated you know, connectivity and Azure Bastion with the Kerberos authentication, which I mentioned in the previous you know, preview. So basically, there are lots of ways to do that to, to disable or to blunt the RDP brute force attacks. But in the same time, it is going to really require a lot of administrative efforts to actually just enable it. So like you have to have you know two factor authentication using complex mm -hmm. passwords like you have to limit the amount of data that is that the ports are going to be open. So lots of components and then although that I actually just mentioned about you know on the right side of this here that you see that disabling the public IP address and use point to site VPN site to site VPN okay what about like we have something really easy to use which is the Azure data standard a SKU solution for you know, um, uh, preventing those kind of like, you know, um, uh, logging attacks. So basically what you can do is that um, you can use Azure DDoS standard to protect, let's say that application gateway with WAF in it, which is going to distribute the traffic to on-premises and publish application service on the back end. On-premises app server will only accept the network traffic from the application gateway IP ranges then. So then we're using Azure Firewall to protect non-web application like FTP. So simplified configuration immediately protects all the resources on a virtual network as soon as Azure DDoS is enabled. So the answer, I am just going to make it very simple. Why do I need to have Azure DDoS to prevent brute force attacks, to 
provide security to every single thing that you see here in this to protect it against the brute force attacks so that your system is not going to be down because the attacker is designing it or targeting the backend servers to be down so they can attack. They can actually just, they can say, you know, um, the surface is clean for them to get into and just mess up with the backend servers. So Azure DDoS Protection Standard is going to help, especially if any of our customers are enabling the, you know, the standard SKU, they also get the um, SLA associated with that. And then there are lots of, you know, benefits of it. So now the question is, what about the DDoS basic? It is free. So I'm going to be honest. It is free, but it is very basic level infrastructure protection based on the Azure region and data center traffic volume and scale of Azure Pass services. Yes, it ensures that those services availability is not impacted, but it's not guaranteeing that a customer's applications availability um, is going to be there all the time. So basically, we won't be able to actually just promise anything because there's no SLA around it. With the standard, we are providing SLA guarantee that the customer's applications availability and performance won't be impacted during the DDoS attack. And then the key thing is Azure is so proud. We are not charging any of our customers during the DDoS attacks. There is no egress charges our customers are paying anymore. It is credit back to their account, which is a very key point that I would like to highlight. Any questions so far, guys? So basically what you're saying is <clears throat> I should always use free. I mean, there's not, but <clears throat> yeah. ideally I should um, update to the standard. Exactly. That, 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 that was my also question. Yeah, so, uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, my service is not so important, but I think we should always somehow start with basic, <clears throat> what Holger mentioned. So, yeah. and, and wait and see. So if my business is growing, probably I will switch to standard, yeah. Exactly. So, and okay. also like with the standard, this is some, you, you guys are amazing, right? Absolutely. Just start with the, the last, you know, basic and then upgrade it. Because now the key benefit is that for, for, for our viewers to know, Microsoft offers this 99.99% SLA with the Azure DDoS standard, which means that if, if the application is under attack, it is a guarantee that the application's availability and performance of a CP system is not going to be impacted during the DDoS attacks, which is something because we're all talking about the VM SKU and then how the IOPS and then, you know, maximum throughput is important for the storage layout that we are doing the software swiping. We're using ultra disks, for example, for the VM performance. But at the same time, what about the network brute force attacks? If somebody's attacking my backend server constantly, if there's no protection around it, and then it is gonna be a little bit like awkward for me because why I'm spending a lot of focus on the VM performance, but at the same time, I am literally ignoring the Bruce Ward's attacks that are happening every day. This is not going to stop. As long as we have the public internet, we are always going to have the brute force attacks, but we have a solution, it is actually very good solution and i am now going to tell you how to make it even better for the deployments so mm -hmm. now you guys are going to look at this what is this right let me just like you know uh, populate this slide completely and go back i am just going to tell you one scenario where we can have the WAF functionality which is the web application firewall free with using the Azure DDoS standard, because the second that you are enabling Azure DDoS standard, Microsoft Azure automatically discounts the WAF cost hmm. and then it is free. Okay. So this is amazing. So for, for our viewers to actually just get more you know, excited, I have a scenario which I'm going to be talking about. We're going to be duplicating the backend application to a paired region, which is going to be the paired region dedicated SAP systems in the DR. We're going to duplicate the application gateway without the WAF in a new paired region for the new backend. <clears throat> so basically, we have the application gateway, but I am removing the WAF on it because now I am going to be using the Azure DDoS and now it is going to be free. So, but I'm not even going to be using application gateway WAF. I am going to be using the front door with global WAF. The reason why I'm using global WAF is to 
actually replicate the traffic to the secondary region. So I am going to be creating a front door with global WAF. So the public IP addresses of each application gateway for the front door backend is now going to be covered by the scenario. <clears throat> so the customer is going to purchase the DDoS standard, which is going to be around $3,000 a month. They're going to apply the DDoS standard to here in this example that you are doing it in two VNets. So in, in each region for application gateway and in backend servers. So basically what's happening is that I am, although that I am removing WAF from application gateway, I am still using it with the Azure, you know, um, front door and the WAF enabled. So then I am getting the regional redundancy and WAF and access to DDoS AR support, which is going to be around $75,000 a year with two Azure DDoS actually just enabled. If you do the Azure DDoS on the hub, you are just going to increase it. It's going to be like maybe, you know, like a close to $100,000. But now you are going to be getting the, the regional redundancy with this scenario. You're going to get to WAF because WAF for free. You're going to have access to DDoS ARR support, which is going to be also secured with the 99.99% SLA, and there's not going to be any egress charges back to you. So this kind of like a scenario is going to give you global anycast, free managed TLS, forced TLS, which is via redirection, minimum TLS version 1.2, rate limiting, managed WAF, IP geo restrictions, custom WAF rules, which is in a reactive manner, and you will be still be able to use your you know, backup solution. You're going to be able to just you know, replicate the database to the DR side, and then you will have the duplicated application servers on the DR side. So this kind of like a scenario is not only going to save the customer a lot of money, it is also going to be protecting the resources in both Azure Region 1 in Azure, Azure Region 2. This is something, Henry, yes. I thought you're a cloud solution architect, not a seller. <laughs> <laughs> you're making a fantastic selling e pitch here. E exactly. So this is this is the this is the key, right? Because we are all technical people, but in the same time, we also need to think about the budget of our customers because they would like to like this is the reason why I said about optimize SAP and Azure architecture with front door and WAF. Just like with the front door. Now you are actually just enabling the regional, like you know, from, uh, resiliency and the redundancy, and then you're getting WAF, and then still the technicality is still there, and now the customer is saving some money. So I wonder if you guys like this kind of like a scenario. But um, I was very excited when I actually just tested it out, and then I also just worked with some of the the engineers um, uh, from Microsoft side, and then this works. And now we are so excited to actually just like you know, bring it up to the attention of our audience. Cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. So with this one, I am actually just going to be talking about the hub and spoke topology. So basically, in the previous slide, we still have the hub. So now the question is, then why are we still using hub? Hub VNet, why do we have it? Because in Azure VNet, it is used as the hub in the spoke and the hub and spoke topology. So the reason why I'm showing this actually, because in the scenario which I'm going to be mentioning with some diagrams, it is going to even give more like, you know, thoughts to our customers and partners on leveraging optimized SAP on Azure. So like this is this is actually the foundation of my next slides. So basically the hub is the central point of connectivity to the customer's own premises systems. It is the central point of connectivity. It is very simple, right? So it's a place to host shared services that can be consumed by different you know, workloads hosted in the spoke VNets. It might be SAP or non-SAP. The hub VNet is typically mapped directly to an IT subscription, right? So Robert actually likes the subscription topic a lot. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's one of those core people actually who know what a subscription and then what a subscription is, what is a resource management, what is the segregation? He knows it so well, but not everybody knows it or understands that. But I am just going to explain that. I'm going to explain in a way that in a in a level, Robert 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 level, 
like you know rubber bob on level maybe maybe it is going be to be careful. something even my <laughs> analogy so any virtual machine and workloads deployed in the hot vnet will be <clears throat> invisible to tenant subscriptions that are mapped to spoke vnets i'm gonna repeat that so any virtual machine and workloads which our customers and partners deploy in the hub vnet will be invisible to tenant subscriptions that are mapped to spoke vnets that are mapped to spoke vnets because the spoke vnets you know what is what is exactly spoke vnet right one or more azure vnets that are used as spoke in the hub and spoke topology so spoke vnets are focused on like the tenant workloads tenant workloads so this spoke vnets could be representation of different application states like application states and departments or line of business it might be a different line of business so it is coming for it and also security professionals to be granted like we call it role based access control we have 1500s of those so basically this it security professionals they can be granted the role based access control to these folks to maintain infrastructure components such as vnets network security groups raw tables which i love i use network security groups with the nsgs for inbound traffic control raw tables again i said like so forth like lots of those basically spokes can be used to isolate the workloads in their vnets it is important because it is managed separately from other spokes that is very key it is managed separately from other spokes so each workload might include multiple tiers like multiple subnets connected to azure load balancers for example so and we also have we also know due to the nature of the vnets being non-transitive by default spoke vnets are mm -hmm. isolated from each other <clears throat> so there's there's no question on this right we all know that vnet peering and then spokes isolation vnet peering is a non-transitive and then we say it like low latency connection between two vnets it is the core of our connectivity in Azure Backbone because once peered, the VNets exchange the traffic by using Azure Backbone without the need for a router. So in a spoke network topology, we are using the VNet peering to connect the hub to each spoke so then they can peer the virtual networks in the same region or different regions. Like then if they wanna do different regions, they are using something like Azure Front Door. They can even use technologies like DNS based routing technologies of their choice. So they can configure the spokes to use the hub VNS Express route on Azure VPN gateway to communicate with on premises networks. Now, let me go to the next slide. Show something that Robert is going to be excited to see. Our customers and partners are asking me, hey, you're a security guy. Tell me about end to end security. How can I enable this? How simple this diagram is, right? When I put it together, um, Heather Sese, you guys know Heather from uh, GBB. Mm -hmm. I asked her, hey, is this so too simple? She said, this is it. And then after that, I said, you know what? I don't need to spend more time and focus to create something even more complex. What is it? IPsec over express route end-to-end -end encrypted traffic in transit. So basically you can configure a site-to-site -site VPN to a virtual network gateway over an express route private peering using RFC 1918 IP address. So this is the standard, right? So why do we do that? Why do we use this configuration? It is because it is the traffic over private peering is first encrypted. Point to site users connecting to the virtual network gateway can use the express route via the site to site tunnel to access the on-premises resources in a tunnel is again security. So mm -hmm. it is possible to deploy site-to-site -site VPN connection over express route private peering right at the same time as site-to-site -site VPN connections via the internet on the same VPN gateway is called IPsec over express route. So mm -hmm. with this, the traffic from on-premises networks to Azure, mm -hmm. the Azure prefixes are now advertised via both the express route private peering VGP, broader uh, gateway protocol, and the VPN BGP. So the result is that now you have two network routes, paths towards Azure from the on-premises networks, fully end-to-end -end encrypted in a transit. So 
this is actually really addressing many of our customers you know concerns about public cloud security <clears throat> enable ipsec over express route and then this is going to actually just address your needs how do you want to do that reach out to me and i'm just going to show you in less than five minutes <laughs> so let's go ahead and just like you know now talk about the optimized customer cpu and azure deployments i'm going to be talking about three four five slides and done where spoke to spoke communication is required, there are three different options for allowing this connectivity. Each option has advantages and disadvantages or pros and cons. I'm just going to lay out all these pros and cons of inter-region communications. So these options can be commingled for various workloads, not only SAP. So if express route, this is the classic hub and spoke architecture, the one that I talked about in the previous slide. The, the, the single slide hub and spoke why it is important for the you know of, um, uh, central point of connectivity. So if express route is in use to allow connectivity from on-premises locations, we are leveraging the express route circuit to provide this native spoke to spoke communication, either a default route or quad zero or a summary route comprising all the networks for the region. VNets can be injected via VGP across express route. This is very important. The Microsoft Edge routers, which you, you guys are seeing here, they're receiving the summary routes of the hub and spoke units in the West region on the slide. So basically, they're getting it from the West region. Specifically, Microsoft Enterprise Edge servers will know about the routes 10.0.0.0.16 from West 2 hub and also 10.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
The advantage of this approach is that by advertising a summary or default route, we are really providing the ability for spoke-to-spoke -spoke routing natively within the Azure backbone via the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. So also this traffic is then specifically identified with Azure, so it's not triggering any VNet peering costs. Now, no peering costs. So Holger, you said you're a good sales guy. Maybe I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say why. Because our customers, they would like to maximize their investment on Azure, and they would like to leverage technologies and then solutions to disable some of the additional incurred expenses or overheads. So if you're using this kind of an approach by advertising the summary or default route, then they are going to be providing themselves with the ability for spoke-to-spoke -spoke routing, which is going to happen natively within the Azure backbone via the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. So then this traffic is going to be identified with uh, within Azure. It is not going to trigger any VNet peering cost. So if you want to save mm -hmm. money on the peering cost, VNet peering cost, there it is. It is completely free to the customer. They can definitely just use it. So the downside of this is that is I mean, of course, we have we also need to just tell from the technical side. What is the technically <clears throat> downside to this kind of like an approach is that the traffic is going to be now limited to the bandwidth of the express route gateway SKU. Then the latency of hairpinning of the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, which are in the peering location of the express route circuit. This is going to be factored in. So now what are we going to do for that? You have to just like calculate size your express route bandwidth accordingly. Do not start with the low margin. Just go with a little bit like abundance so that you are not going to have any kind of like, you know, issues with the um, latency or with the performance of that. So basically, if I'm using express route gateway SKU like the standard, I have a bandwidth limit of, you know, one gig. So this this throughput will will also apply to spoke to spoke communication using this method. So there is a reason why if a customer wants to save money on the VNet peering costs, they have to definitely just like you know uh, take a look at the downside of this one because again this is the express route gateway SKU size and then latency of the hairpinning off of the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, which are in the peering location of the express route circuit are going to be the factors for a little bit performance issue. Aside from that, if the customer is okay with such a solution, this is going to be 100% eliminating the VNet peering costs. Cool. And I think that um, I have 15 minutes more, right? Something like that. Uh, Robert, just, just doing a time check. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> so basically, I'm going to show you the other option with the MVA, the third party MVA in the hub. So this is something that our customers are bringing up or partners are bringing up. Hey, tell me a solution. Show me a solution where, which I can just use to showcase it. This kind of an approach has some advantages over option one, which I just used with the Microsoft Enterprise Edges. However, this kind of an approach comes with its own set of disadvantages as well. So there are advantages like disadvantages like I mentioned. So compared to option one, in which we are riding all the way down to the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, we are now manually doing this at the hub level. So as a result, you know, we no longer need to wear, worry about advertising in a default or summer route with the option one, with manual effort, just like riding down to Microsoft Enterprise Edge. So what is the, what is the, benefit of that again like we no longer again this is this is the common 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 thing we're not going to worry about the summary route which may relieve some administrative overhead but also like resolving some lower latency as we are communicating through a hub rather than through a you know a microsoft enterprise edge so in a you know environment like that like in reality like what we're, we're what we're doing right. here is that like we're using the hub uh, we're using the MVA in the spoke. In reality, the improvement here is that like it is really low as the Azure backbone doesn't take, doesn't add too much latency. So basically, this might be beneficial for workloads looking to, you know, um, reduce some additional milliseconds 
this kind of like an approach. Additionally, we do not have the bandwidth limitation of the express route gateway. If this is no longer in the path like the previous one. So the advantage of this one is like leveraging an MVA for the for this functionality will be the granular control and inspection capabilities this MVA comes with. Basically, spoke to spoke traffic can now be fully inspected, unlike the Microsoft Enterprise Edge one. And then it might be subject to the MVA's granular policy set using this method. Basically, there are going to be third party MVA policies associated with that. So, however, spoke to spoke inspection is going to be enabled. But the disadvantage of this kind of approach comes first with the cost of deploying an MVA. Regardless of the MVA chosen, there will be an additional cost for running the MVA and typically a throughput cost for the traffic traversing the MVA. So while we are losing the bandwidth limitation of the express route gateway in this scenario, MVAs have the bandwidth limitations of their own, which could be bottlenecked for this kind of like a traffic. Basically, <coughs> we first need to understand the specific throughput limitations of the MVA, which we are using to, you know, to deploy in the spoke when leveraging this kind of like a method. So bottom line is that when leveraging option one, the Azure Fabric was recognizing this path, this data path, and then it's not applying charges for the traffic when it traverses the VNet peering. If a customer using an MVA, all the traffic which traverses VNet peerings to reach the MVA will incur VNet peering costs. Mm -hmm. So let's say rule of thumb, if you're using MVA, and then if you are doing the routing through the MVA, you have to pay the VNet peering costs. So then VNet peering costs need to be included. Is that going to be any additional kind of like latency? No, but MVA licensing and VNet peering mm -hmm. costs should be included. So this is the third party MVA in the hub. And then the VNet peering, right? This is the third option, which is something that I am eliminating the, the, the need for the MVA. This is the third option for allowing spoke to spoke communication will be directly peering the spokes requiring this communication. Similar how each spoke is each spoke in VNet peer to the hub. An additional VNet peer will be created between the two spokes which require this communication. So advantage of this kind of an approach is that spokes are now directly connected via the Azure backbone. Basically, you have the lowest latency path possible. You have additionally no bandwidth restrictions exist along the path. So hosts are only limited by the amount of data that they can push. That's it. And then, of course, this is the good part. Then you're going to say, Holger, hey, what is the disadvantage of this one? You said about this, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, um, uh, say advantages and disadvantages and disappear or say advantages and then not mention about disadvantages and disappear. <clears throat> I want to be, I want to actually just be, you know, a little bit, you know, um, uh, equal here. So this advantages of this kind of like an approach is that additional costs associated with the VNet peering, as well as the scale limitations should spoke, you know, um, continues to grow. Basically, multiple spokes are now introduced behind a hub and require a connectivity. A full mesh of VNet peers then will be required to provide this kind of connectivity. So if the hub and spoke model is replicated across regions, then spoke to spoke communication options change a little bit. Basically, in most of the environments where spoke to spoke communication is required between regions, then there are different options for allowing this kind of lack of connectivity. So each option has then advantages and disadvantages. One of the option was, again, like in, in the uh, couple slides before this, like the front door use and then you know, um, duplicating the application to the DR region and just go the go go through the the routing <clears throat> in between those two was one of them. But each option again has advantages and disadvantages, which will be discussed. You know, from in the next uh, interregion communication uh, section, which I actually just mentioned about. So basically, now this is the interregion VNet routing options interregional Azure communication for the private deployment to write over the Microsoft backbone. So, and also the key on this one. So this is called bowtie deployment. It, you know, a best practice for providing the redundancy and connectivity between regions and on-premises is absolutely the bowtie connection using Express Route mm -hmm. gateways with adjacent Express Route circuits 
in different regions, as you guys can see in this slide. So the advantage of this is that it not only provides this connectivity to on-premises, but you also establish connectivity between express route circuits to cross regional VNets with no transit charges, no transit charges at all. The bow tie across regional connectivity between these two VNets, between the VNets on the primary and then the secondary to the express route circuits will enable these communications between the US West 2 VNet hub and spoke to communicate with the US East 2 VNet hub and spokes. So this option is something that like majority of our customers are leveraging as it is allowing interregional Azure communication for the private deployment um, to ride over the Microsoft backbone. So why we are saying that? Because once it is running on Microsoft backbone, it is the TLS 1.2 for the data in transit encryption. So the hot VNet attached to the express route gateway is now advertising its VNet address space as well as connected VNet spoke addresses by selecting use remote gateway towards the express route circuit. Since both regions are bow tied, each hub VNet will now learn all the neighboring regions, the VNets, and then provide this native communication between any inter-region hub to hub and hub to spoke and spoke to spoke communication. So again, like in the first diagram, the Microsoft Edge routers will receive the summary routes of the hub and spoke VNets in the US West 2 region. Specifically, the MSEEs will know about the routes from West 2 uh, hub and, and also from West 2 spoke 1 and also West 2 spoke 2. So in this, you're only capable, you know, of, um, you're actually just achieving that the Microsoft Enterprise ages now are capable to route the device that knows about these individual routes. So as these routes get advertised from the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, then the hub in each region will receive its neighboring region routes and propagate this feature down into the spokes. So with this, you are actually achieving that each spoke now has a new route to reach networks in the other region. So since the uh, Microsoft Enterprise Edge are now becoming aware of the individual routes, now you're able to route that um, route back up the express route to the other spoke. So the advantage of this approach is then, you know, simplifying this bow tie connection or bow tie uh, connectivity to the express route gateways in each region, to each region's express route circuits, you get the ability for the inter-region hub to hub and hub to spoke and spoke to spoke routing, which is going to happen natively within the Azure backbone. So then there's not going to be any, you know, uh, transit fees at all. So then the advantage, this advantages will be, again, this is going to be, you know, um, the bandwidth limitations of the express route gateway skew, like the, the first scenario that I just talked about, and latency of the hairpinning of the Microsoft Enterprise Edge is going to still be applicable for that. So again, the first scenario which I mentioned, so this scenario for the, you know, um, regional replication, you still need to have the um, consideration of the um, express route uh, circuit bandwidth accordingly to eliminate any kind of bottlenecks down the road. One question. Uh, yes. Um, so when you mentioned that, I mean, but you know, uh, communication is going over um, express route gateway. So you have egress there. You don't have ingress, but you have egress. So you need to pay that because for gateway perspective, you are going out, correct? That is, that, that is, that is correct. Okay. Your, your, okay. Yeah, I'm understanding. Yeah, that, that, that is not going to, that is not going to change the fact, but as long as you're staying in the Microsoft backbone, you won't necessarily just, um, this is actually going to be uh, articulated in the next slide as well. As okay. long as you have it in the uh, bow tie deployment, the overall egress charges are eliminated half. So let me just like, you know, tell you okay. like in, in a, in a, in a, um, in a scenario like this. So this is the, I'm also going to be speaking about global VNet peering. So this is the secondary option for allowing inter-region spoke-to-spoke -spoke communication to leverage an MVA in each hub VNet. This is majority mm -hmm. of our finance companies, our customers are using, they're routing the traffic between the spokes. So in this, in this scenario, they're deploying an MVA of their choosing like it can be any MVA of their choice into the hub. So then they define UDRs within each spoke 
route to the MVA to get to the other spoke. So as opposed to option one, the previous one, in which you're routing all the traffic down to the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, so you're manually doing this at the hub level. So as a result, you know, you're having some lower latency as you're communicating through a hub via the global VNet peering rather than through a Microsoft Enterprise Edge. So you're not okay. having any kind of bandwidth limitations of the Express Route Gateway on egress traffic patterns. Yep. This is no yep. longer yep. in the path. So okay. one final advantage of this leveraging MVA for this functionality will be the granular control inspection capabilities. So this MVA comes with. So basically the spoke to spoke traffic can now be again fully inspected subject to the MVA's granular policy set using this method. But the advantage, disadvantages of this is going to be come first with the cost of deploying an MVA with, you know, the cost of the MVA and then, you know, for the licensing and stuff. But regardless of MVA chosen, there will be an additional cost for running the MVA and typically throughput cost for the traffic traversing the MVA. So you're losing the bandwidth limitation of the express route gateway in this scenario. And MVAs have bandwidth limitations of their own, which could be bottleneck for this kind of traffic. Basically, customers need to understand the specific throughput limitations of the MVA, which they're choosing will be very important when leveraging this kind of method. So basically, when you're leveraging option one, the Azure Fabric, again, is recognizing this data path, does not apply to charges for the traffic, the answer to your question. But when it traverses the VNet peerings, um, is, is, is not. But if using an MVA, then all the traffic which traverses the VNet peerings that you are reaching to the MVA will mm. incur VNet peering costs. Yeah. Basically, okay. that is not going to change the fact. So. It is all depending on what you're trying to do. If you want to do a lot of inspections, yes, you're going to need to pay for the VNet peerings to reach to that MVA is going to absolutely just incur costs. Okay. Basically, so this is the last option. Maybe this is going to be maybe some, some viewers best option. So this is the third option for allowing spoke to spoke communication will be to directly global VNet peering so that the spokes require this communication and they're going to communicate accordingly, similar to how each spoke is VNet peer to the hub and global VNet peering will be created between the two spokes which require this kind of communication. This is the good good, good aspect of it, but the uh, disadvantage, this is maybe the advantage, maybe the advantage, I can even just say more like, you know, you can now with the spokes, you can now directly connect via the Azure backbone and now have the lowest latency and highest bandwidth po possible, there is no replication costs because everything is now running on Azure Backbone. No egress on this one because why? You're running everything on Azure Backbone. But the disadvantage of this approach is that going to be the additional cost associated with the global VNet peering as well as the scale limitations that like each spoke will need to grow. So as multiple spokes are introduced, behind the hub, and then they're going to require connectivity, and the full mesh of VNet peers will be required to provide this kind of connectivity. So okay. basically, this is an option, right? But in the same time, it also comes with disadvantages. The disadvantages of this approach is, again, additional costs associated with the global VNet peering, as well as the scale limitations. But each, each solution, which I actually just mentioned, is going to address mm. one or two or three customers' requirements. Basically, okay. We don't have one prescribed solution. We have multiple options, but one thing that doesn't change is how we are onboarding it. So basically, customers are still going to be very focused on how they are just going to create this kind of granularity. Basically, this comes with the question on like what, what is needed from their perspective. Like we have, I mentioned about six options. So in each option, there is a value and there's a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But one thing doesn't change. The, the, the slide that you see here, our customers are still going to need to have financial approval. They're going to need to have cloud core teams, infrastructure teams, network teams, firewall teams, proxy teams, and CP application teams to actually just manage the onboarding process. But now there's also the importance of the partner ecosystem of Microsoft. If our customers are choosing the preferred partner or the partner of their choice, 
which are certified by Azure and Microsoft. They are going to be able to reduce these administrative efforts. They will be able to actually just have the partners do all these tasks. Basically, um, our partners are going to be working with the customers to obtain the cost center and budget. They're going to create the resource groups with the core cloud team within the customer. They're going to create the budget alerts. They're going to add tags to the cost center. They're going to request subnets, create the subnets. They're going to configure UDRs. Everything that I mentioned about in the previous slides, they need to be looking at this very granular. They need to be looking at this very focused because they're still going to um, want to deploy the NSGs. They still going to need to have the infrastructure team working with them. They are still going to have the security teams to take a look at the security rules and then exclusions that comes with Azure Firewall and other technologies like the web application firewall. They're going to need to do the proxy request and then they will go ahead and just take the, you know, the possession of the resources and create the VMs with or without the partners. But this is not going to change the fact that there's still going to be tremendous effort to be able to deploy those architectures. So that's why we are encouraging our customers to work with our Microsoft partners to help them reduce these complexities. And Microsoft is going to help both the partners and then the customers to deploy SAP on Azure in the most optimized and secure manner possible. So this actually just um, ends my presentation, but I would like to ask one question to you guys. And then this question is also going to be asked to the overall you know, audience today. So basically this, this question comes important as majority of our customers, regardless of their you know, um, uh, requirements for deployment, Compliance and security is not changing. Basically, majority of our customers are asking the maximum security rules and functions to deploy on Azure. So I, I just chose this question, for example, like I was challenged by one of the customers that Microsoft wouldn't have a solution to see the original incoming IP address uh, for intrusion detection, but I absolutely had an answer. So now this customer is running the solution on Azure and they are absolutely helping themselves with the intrusion detection. So now my question to you guys, what is the easiest way to see the original incoming IP address to help customers with intrusion detection? I'm not going to ask you to answer this question because there are lots of ways to achieve that, but the easiest way to see the original incoming IP address is absolutely leveraging Azure Application Gateway in front of Azure Firewall to capture the incoming packet source IP address. So because now we have Azure Firewall Premium, this design can support end-to-end -end scenarios today. So basically where the Azure Firewall leverages TLS inspection to perform intrusion detection and prevention on the encrypted traffic between the application and gateway and then the backend. So basically leveraging Azure Application Gateway and Azure Firewall in a design like this it is appropriate for the applications that need to know incoming client source IP addresses. For, ex for example, to serve geological uh, specific content or for, for logging, Azure Firewall SNAS the incoming traffic, changing the original source IP address, then application gateway in front of the Azure Firewall captures the incoming packets source IP address in the X forwarded um, for header, so that the web server can now see the original IP address in this header. So basically, Microsoft has solutions to address each and every customer's SAP deployments on Azure. All they need to do is to reach out to their Microsoft account executives, mm -hmm. their associated partners, and they reach out to us. We help them deploy, optimize, and secure SAP on Azure. And with this, I complete my um, presentation, guys. <laughs> Thank you, okay, I, I have I have many questions, but I'm afraid to ask because we don't have any more time. We will leave that for for next time. Uh, Absolutely. Maybe maybe next time we'll have a Q and A session just with exactly. You. Okay. Let, no. Let's go. Let's combine all Aaron's uh, sessions and the uh, Q and A. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Again, right. there are lots of options to deploy SAP and Azure. Uh, we just need to be able to be focused and granular. So if our if our customers need secure SAP optimize SAP, Microsoft is the place for them to come to. Oh, great. Fantastic ending statement. But I actually like the idea, maybe we can really 
start collecting a few more questions um, from the audience. Um, I mean, you are getting questions all the time. Maybe we can do an um, FAQ with you, basically. So um, yeah, absolutely. That we just um, collect some questions, then we set up a uh, another session. Because I mean, the amount of information that you just presented today again is 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 just mind blowing. So um, <laughs> lots of information to catch up. But yeah, let, let let's do that. Let's um, schedule another um, meeting at some point where we just where we have an Ask Evren session or something like that. <laughs> sure, I I would love to do that. Perfect. Yeah, great. Good. Then thank you again for a fantastic um, rundown. Um, thanks for sharing all the information for for creating some beautiful slides. Um, yeah, and as I said, My we pleasure. will definitely see you again. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.